on the Houston Museum of Natural Sciences New Hall of Ancient Egypt. Uh, thank you, Emily. Uh, so Houston, uh, the largest city in Texas, the fourth largest in the United States, uh, the largest medical complex in the world, and uh, all such uh, wonderful facts. Uh, of more interest to this audience is that it will be the host of the 2015 RC conference and in the, mu the Museum of Natural Science uh, it's now home to the United States uh, newest museum display of ancient Egypt. Uh, the Museum of Natural Science celebrated its centenary in 2009. Uh, we're one of the uh, most visited museums in the US and not just an impressive uh, half a million uh, visitors of school age, which gives you some idea of uh, one of our most important uh, audiences. Um, as the name suggests, we are not a museum of art, but one of natural science. We deal with the ologies, uh, biology, geology, paleontology, and where we display a human material, we do so under an anthropological uh, umbrella. Uh, we celebrated our centenary, as I said, in 2009 with a capital campaign, um, which bore fruit in 2012 with the opening of the Dan Duncan Wing, uh, which added somewhere in the region of 200,000 square feet of uh, gallery space, uh, teaching rooms, and so on. You can see the uh, double height uh, first floor of the wing uh, as it was before it was filled in May 2012 uh, with the Morian Hall of Paleontology. Uh, so, the so the Natural Science Museum drew its breath briefly in May 2012 uh, before saying in the summer of 2012 that they would open an Egyptian hall on the third floor, in fact, immediately above the Paleo Gallery in, uh, on May 24, 2013, uh, which nine months is, uh, in curatorial terms, those of you who work as curators, is essentially the equivalent of saying, let's do it next Tuesday. <laughs> um, I was hired uh, as uh, a consultant providing Egyptological inputs uh, on the project, and the first, our, our own display, our own collections, um, you can see our previous uh, Egyptian gallery, uh, very small, very nice, but certainly not with 12,500 square feet worth of material. Uh, so the first job was to look for uh, material we could uh, have, we could borrow from uh, other museums, generally from uh, their reserve collections and saying we would, many institutions were very interested to hear of the project, and then when we said, ah, oh, end of May next year, they said, as I was expecting, thank you very much, interesting idea, but we, we regret we can't help you. And it really is due to the um, diligence, charm, and phenomenal organization of uh, Lisa Ribori, the Vice President of Collections at Houston, that we were able to arrange some loans at short notice. And there were four collection um, institutions who saw what we were doing, and liked the idea, and uh, stepped up to uh, the challenge uh, from whom we borrowed. Uh, the first being the Michael C. Carlos Museum in Emory, Georgia, at Emory, at Emory University in Atlanta, Georgia, uh, where Bonnie's where they have um, fine collections and also material in reserve. And Bonnie Speed, the director, Peter Macavara, the curator for Egyptian arts, and René Stein, the head of conservation, liked the idea, had material they were willing to lend, and then said, ah, but this stuff needs uh, conserving. And so as part of the loan agreements, uh, we are funding an annual internship for a final year graduates, students of conservation, to come to the Carlos to work on the material that will then be going to Houston. And you can see here uh, Alexis North, our first uh, uh, conservation student 
in terms of uh, preparing the cat's money for, uh, for display. Um, the position, I think, for this coming, this coming summer 2014 has, is being filled, but those of you with friends who are studying conservation, I'd urge you to alert them to the possibility uh, of this in future years. Uh, then we also approach the Pelopseus Museum in Hildesheim, Germany. Uh, Regina Schultz, their, their current director, is, will be known to you um, as the former curator of ancient art at the Walters Art Gallery in Baltimore. Uh, the Pelopseus um, has been coming uh, under stress from local funding, and there's been a sort of movement in the in city government saying, why do you have this, this museum full of marvellous objects from Hermann Ilka's excavations at Giza? What's the use to us? And so being able on our side to borrow some of their reserve material was also a great sort of political tool for them. They could say no. Um, this is a world famous collection, much in demand. And similarly, uh, you see the material for loan needed conservation, and so as one of the conditions of loan, we were um, we, we found a, a conservator there, which takes some of the pressure off their own budgets. Uh, the third institution is closer to home for me. It's Chillingston Castle in Kent, the Garden of England, 45 minutes from Heathrow. If you're thinking to travel, which is, um, it's the home, it was the home of a man called Dennis Bauer, who died in, his, in 1977. He was a man that I can't do justice to in the length of this talk. He was a collector, um, a criminal, possibly a spy, um, but he believed himself to be the reincarnation uh, of Bonnie Prince Charlie, the um, story has it. And he formed a very fine collection of small Egyptian objects. Um, as someone who's a, who takes a great interest in the history of collecting, it's been great fun to, uh, um, to look at this. Uh, the, the house has always had financial problems, and they closed for two years, uh, in the course of which um, poor climate control meant that several pieces were uh, damaged by cold, damp, mold and so on. Uh, and so we were able to, on a similar basis, to borrow pieces, um, saying we, these we will conserve, and also as they now have no uh, professional Egyptologist on their staff, to provide uh, uh, Egyptological uh, inputs um, to make a, dis a display for them uh, and to, cap to research the collections. Uh, one piece we've already started looking at is this Horrible little head. Um, <laughs> it's made, however, from a very heavy, very cold material. And if you can read the, um, in the label on the base, it says, uh, very rare Egyptian head carved from a meteorite, Old Kingdom. It doesn't look Old Kingdom, but the weird material it's made from does make you think, well, maybe it's a metallic meteorite. And that would be great fun, Egyptologically. And so uh, you can also see he paid a uh, pound for it. Um, <laughs> and here you can see Dirk van Turenhout, the museum's curator of uh, anthropology, and James Wooten, our, um, our uh, astronomer for the Museum Planetarium, holding a magnet to it to see whether or not it contains meteoric iron. And not to my great surprise, it doesn't. <laughs> uh, but, but this is an example of some of the research we'll be doing on the Chillingston collection, finding out what they have, how it was acquired, and for what reasons. And last but not least among the four major lenders is the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston, who uh, lent us um, a little over a hundred pieces, um, which they had uh, packed up. Um, in their storerooms and were willing to, to loan them. So to all of our lenders, some of whom I can see in the audience, thank you very much. So by, the, by December, I thought we had pretty much the objects we would be able to display and we could start thinking how do we want, how do we want to display them. Uh, I then had an email from the museum president on Christmas Eve uh, saying, I'm in Sydney. Uh, 
uh, would you like to, would, would it be worthwhile having this? And this is um, <laughs> a late 18th dynasty granodiorite bust of a, an official, generally regarded by people who like to put names on things as being a representation of Horinger as an official for the kind of king. Maybe, maybe not. Uh, the Nicholson Museum in Sydney, which owns the piece, is closed for renovation. Our president was there on other business, saw an opportunity, and jumped for it. And then I thought we had everything. But then one of our trustees in, I think, February said, oh, you're, um, you're building a new Egyptian display. How nice. Do you know that uh, I, I went to someone's place for dinner and they had a mummy? <laughs> and we tracked it down. And it's this uh, third intermediate period yellow painted coffin with a mummy inside, which formerly belonged to the Help a uh, historical society in Cleveland, Ohio, which had owned it since the 1900s and later de accessioned it. And uh, I'm not going to talk any more about this because Robert Rickner is speaking on the piece, qua piece rather than qua exhibit, tomorrow at 9 a.m. So most of the pieces we have are, I've been talking about, are loans, and that is a sort of problem and uh, a, be a benefit is that. Uh, things that come into you as loans eventually leave you. The objects I, in these loans are, will be at the museum for around three to five years, and that at least gives us breathing space to go back to other institutions saying, well, you, you so unsurprisingly, you felt you couldn't help us at nine months' notice, but now, three years down the line, what do you feel you would be willing to lend? Um, and it also means that there's no excuse not to keep the displays up to date and the labels uh, accurate. Um, oops, I noticed this uh, the day after the event. <laughs> <laughs> I'm bringing the So the tagline for the display is that we have a permanent display, but it's also a permanently changing. <laughs> so, in the time that's left, I'll just whisk you around the display. It falls basically into five distinct sections. Um, we don't have the material to give sort of a chronological conspectus of Egyptian culture, and I also don't think that's what most visitors to an Egyptian display want or indeed find useful at the moment, at, at present. Um, it's more thematic. Uh, and so the first, ooh, passing over that, um, the first gallery um, has the, the timeline of the offending King Fanny. <laughs> <laughs> A couple of cases cited Egypt in its own environment, and then um, cases of uh, prehistoric, pre dynastic, and early dynastic material psyching you up to the dynastic periods, uh, the meet and two veg of the displays, and the, and the first large room you come into uh, is on what everyone tends to call daily life, and that's not a term I'm particularly happy with because it's rather reductive, but it's rather harder to say ancient Egyptian life ways with particular reference to this and that. <laughs> so, while, while we, we have a few years to think of something, a more subtle way of promoting it, this is, for all intents and purposes, daily life. Uh, Houston is 18 hours and $1,200 away from Egypt, and the tourist trade in Egypt, as we all know, is, uh, is not going up. So most of our visitors will never visit Egypt, and so the museum president and the designers felt that um, a display which gave a sort of an Egyptian ambiance would help people understand where this material is coming from. And it is, of course, something with a proud museological tradition. On the bottom left, you have the uh, Artists Museum in Berlin from the 1850s, and then top right, um, somewhere I would recommend your visit. It's in Preston, North England, and it's their balcony with um, Egyptian views Pompeloi reliefs, and then on top, uh, Assyrian plaster casts, Assyrian reliefs. 
Uh, so again, it's this idea of how do you bring Egypt as a country to people who will never go there. Uh, and a little trade secret, all of our displays were built in house, the cases and the, the mise-en-scene, the pillars and so on. Uh, they're made from styrofoam, carved into, a, um, into shape, put on a wooden core, and then covered with our designer's secret recipe of resins, cement, and paint to a very thick layer, um, which hardens and is, we hope, childproof. We spent a long time <laughs> kicking these pillars as hard as we can to see what that see uh, if they crack and touch wood, that they will hold up pretty well. Uh, a display on scripts and writing. One of the conditions of loan from Boston was that their pieces stayed in their own cases, which really gives an idea of the quality of material they generously lent. And then uh, here is the other case of writing. And I'm proud to say actually that every script used in Egypt in the through to the Coptic period, with the exception of Aramaic, the alabaster there is one of those late period ones with a cuneiform inscription, which is rather cool. Um, it's a fine old kingdom statuary from Hildesheim as a way in to talk about how men and women, what roles they perform, they show themselves performing, um, which then segues into this little case on conventions of representation in two and three dimensions. Uh, the 18th dynasty men here share a wig with this late period lady, and then on this side you can see some beautiful uh, late 18th dynasty women presenting offerings in two dimensions, and then a sculpted version of the same. Uh, you keep going down the, uh, the axis of the hallway, you're brought up short by a head of Ramesses II from Bubastis on loan from Sydney. Uh, you take a left past this uh, uh, second intermediate period head of a king as a moon, which was something we were very pleased to borrow in our unusual type. And then you come into the sort of enfilade of what, for lack of any better term, again, we're calling religion. Um, I don't like the way you sort end up divorcing religion from daily life and life from death, but that's uh, the way it played out. Um, the reliefs on the walls are laser cuts on the styrofoam, which is then firmed up with resin, cement, and so on. Uh, and these are based on uh, PDFs from the Orient Institute of Chicago's epigraphic volumes. So they are grammatically correct. <laughs> and perhaps I should organize a trail for people next, next year to uh, work out where they come from. A small prize at the end. Um, we have a display of Bezes, which I hope would flatten the spirit of Jim Romano from a little first intermediate period one there to a big, hulking Roman one. Um, a case on uh, Hathor and sort of female fertility, the little, the little in joke being that Hathor is prominently obscuring Nin, who's a god of a rather different type of fertility. The pot there is from the Barrows Museum at Santa Ana, and uh, I'd never seen one quite like this before, and was very excited to um, to be able to borrow it. And in fact, a um, one someone from the local press was uh, around when it arrived, and fortunately didn't get printed, but I did get very excited. Um, then you swing into displays of funerary culture, two cases ground you with different beliefs and then rituals surrounding um, funerary, uh, surrounding funerals and the offering cult with a nice pyramidion for Janus. Um, thanks to the loans from Boston and Hildesheim, we have wonderful, we're very lucky to have such amazing Old Kingdom material. So the funerary section, in fact, is, does have a chronological swing to it. Um, those pieces from Hildesheim. Um, but the Middle Kingdom section, the designers wanted to give an impression, again, of a sort of an ambience and a blown up image of one of the Daryl Bursha coffins. I think it really worked wonders for that. And you can see it's a little dark, sorry, but the 
Middle Kingdom coffin that has sort of a virtual frieze de fronde on the top, a headrest, a head end, a necklace, and so on. So we're looking for a pair of Middle Kingdom sandals to <laughs> put at the feet end. Uh, one piece I was astonished the uh, Carlos was willing to lend is their beautiful white painted coffin from the early 18th dynasty, which recent research has shown belonged to Joseph Smith, the founder of Mormonism. Um, and uh, we gave this uh, appropriately early 18th dynasty surround. It's one of those early, two, uh, early New Kingdom tombs from Deron Medina. A dis later, a display of later funerary material, and maybe next year I can talk to you about the cartonage we found in a kitchen in North Carolina. Um, <laughs> the final section, just before we finish, um, we were left having, a rate, having decided what we wanted to put out, we were then left with pieces left over, and as someone who's very interested in how objects are used and abused before, they, before and after they get into museums, we arranged the, these remaining pieces in a sort of mock-up of Dennis Bowers rooms at Chillington Castle in a 19th, early 20th century vitrine. And in fact, in the last few days as we were installing, it was a great pleasure just to be able to arrange things to look nice rather than think how are they working. Um, and in the background, you'll see a video screen flashing up breasteds, uh, Egypt through the stereo stereoscope um, as a way, you know, as the um, terrible cliche, the, um, you know, it was the internet or the TV of its time, but it's how people were bringing Egypt to a wider audience a hundred years ago. The second part of the room is um, essentially a large space for classes to be taught in, and as an actual science, as, as a, a non-art museum, we have no qualms at all about having replicas of the Rosetta Stone, directed by King Flemmy, um, <laughs> and, uh, the bust of Nefertiti, um, and then this large space can accommodate classes very well for teaching. Uh, the final thing is um, one of the very few pieces we purchased is a mason's mallet found in the Torah caves in, in the 1940s by a group of British uh, servicemen, one of whom brought this back and gave it to his Masonic Lodge as this little uh, silver um, <coughs> label tells you where it was used in meetings um, to, to, keep, to, to keep order. And so we paired that with a green bank, which as you know is dripping with uh, Masonic symbolism, the unfinished pyramid and the uh, watching eye and that's brought out by this uh, small uh, wedge at time. So this... <laughs>